Well, good morning once again, brothers and sisters, as we worship together via the internet and as we together call the Sabbath day of the Lord our delight and we rest in it from our daily work and delight in him. And as we do so, let's open with a time of prayer and we'll uh, bring before the Lord our needs as a congregation. Let's pray. O Lord, our great God, we bow before you as your people as we desire to worship you on this, your holy day. And we praise you that you are the God who is everywhere, who is not limited by time or space, and who sees us and hears us wherever we are. And especially that because we are your people and we have your spirit living within us, that you know our needs and our cares even before we ask of them. But Lord, we also lay before you the needs that we have as a congregation. And Lord, we pray that you would be near to us, your people on this day. And especially, Lord, we pray for those who are struggling. We pray for those who are finding it difficult uh, in this time of, uh, of isolation, of, um, of anxiety, of people uh, being forced to, to remain in their homes and Lord we pray that you would bless your people in this day that you would be near to them uh, all who need you in a special way and Lord we pray for our elderly we pray for those who are especially vulnerable to this virus and who are especially confined to their homes we pray that you would keep them safe we pray that you would um, use the efforts that we are making as a community in staying away as a, a blessing to them. And yet, Father, also, please, would they feel your nearness today and also the nearness of us as your people as we desire uh, that they would be well and that they would be able to worship you with joy today. Lord, we pray for those who need you in other ways. We pray for those who are expecting um, children in the, the near future. We pray, Father, that you would bless uh, the pregnant mothers in our congregation and that even though there is some uncertainty as to the healthcare system, that you would uh, keep them from anxiety and that you would have them rest in you. Oh Lord, we pray for those who have ongoing struggles, who deal with um, chronic illness, chronic pain, uh, who deal with mental illness. And Lord, for those who wrestle with their own sin. Lord, we pray that you would help as needed, that you would be near to us as um, we are not able to get together and, and speak to one another about the things that we struggle with. Yet, Lord, help us to reach out to one another. Help us to make our needs known and help us to search out the needs of others in this time. That, Lord, we may rejoice uh, together even though we are apart. And that we may uh, together enjoy the, the fellowship and the love that we have from you in Christ Jesus through the power of the Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles with me. And we're going to be reading from two texts this morning. We're going to be reading, first of all, from Acts 13. Acts 13. Acts 13, and we'll begin reading there at verse 16. And there we read, Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt and with an uplifted arm he led them out from it. For a period of about 40 years he put up with them in the wilderness when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. After he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, 
a man after my heart who will do all my will. From the descendants of this man, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and while John was completing his course, he kept saying, Who do you suppose that I am? I am not he, but behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family, and those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets which are read every Sabbath fulfilled by these condemning him, and though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. When they had carried out all that was written concerning him, They took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to our children in that he raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and through him everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Therefore, take heed, so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers, and marvel and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe." though someone should describe it to you. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them were urging them to continue in the grace of God. So far the reading from Acts 13. Now we'll turn to our text as we continue together looking through some psalms uh, in this time of anxiety and uncertainty and isolation. We're going to be looking today at Psalm 16. Psalm 16. And there we read, a miktam of David. Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have no good besides you. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. So far, the reading of God's word from Psalm 16. Let's bow our heads in prayer. O Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that it teaches us 
And we pray that in it, this morning, we would be able to see your grace, to see your love, to see all the blessings you pour out on those who fear you. And in that way, we would be encouraged in our service of you in our daily lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Is your house your castle? Uh, I, I realize that as I ask that question, some of you may be thinking about your house and thinking now that it's more like a prison than a castle, but, but yet we so often think about our homes as our castle. It's our place where we go at the end of a long day. It's a place where we go to relax. It's a, it's a refuge. It's a shelter. And that's, that's well and good. It, it, it's good that our homes can be a place of peace, a, a place of Uh, safety and security and yet what we always need to remember especially as we look in the psalms is that the psalms direct us to a refuge an eternal refuge a true refuge for the believer and today we're going to see that as we look together in psalm 16 as we we look at this psalm of confidence a, a psalm of confidence about the refuge of the believer the confidence we have in God himself. And so this morning we're going to see that because the Lord is our refuge, we will bless him and will not be shaken. Because the Lord is our refuge, we will bless him and will not be shaken. And we'll see that in three points. First, my Lord. Second, my inheritance. And third, my heart. Well, as we begin the first point, my Lord, we open on this psalm and it begins here with this statement of faith. Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. Now, what we see quite quickly is that this is a psalm that arises out of adversity. We don't know exactly what David is going through at this time. It could be that his, his life is being threatened, but we don't know. There were many times when David underwent adversity from Saul and from other enemies. But we're not told exactly why David wrote this psalm. And yet, in the middle of adversity, he cries out to the Lord, crying out for the protection of the Lord. Preserve me, O God. And why should the Lord preserve David? Well, because as David says, you are my refuge. And this is unpacked in the rest of the psalm. This is the the theme statement for the psalm, taking refuge in God. And it's going to force us to ask the question, where do I take refuge? But as for himself, David says, I said to the Lord, you are my God. You are my Lord. I have no good besides you. He emphasizes this confession that he made in verse 1 with a second confession in verse 2. You are my Lord. And as you can see, perhaps your Bibles show this by using Lord in capital letters. He says, I said to the Lord, meaning he speaks to the covenant name of God about about his, his covenant Lord. He's speaking to God as the God who loves him, the God who is in covenant with his people, the one who is always faithful to his people. And he says, you are my Lord. And what that means for David is that everything good that David has, everything he possesses, everything good in his life, he knows it's all God's doing. That if he is going to be preserved, if he's going to receive that good gift from the Lord, if he's going to have a return to some semblance of a normal life, if he's going to receive the bounty of the Lord, that's all going to come from his hand. God is the only one who gives good gifts things and we saw that didn't we when we read in James chapter 1 where James says that every good and perfect gift comes from above coming down from the father of lights God is the giver of good things as we read in Belgian confession question and answer 1 it says there that God is the overflowing fountain of all good and so David trusts in God to give him Good things. And those good things, David's going to go on to describe at the end of the psalm, and we will get there. 
But in the meantime, he points out in verses 3 and 4 this, this radical division that exists even in Israel. And it exists in our world. On the one hand, he says, as for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. See, God is not only his refuge, God is also the refuge for a whole community, a whole group of people who trust in the Lord. And David says, I place my allegiance with them. I stand with them. I stand with all who are in community with me, who are in community with my God, who trust in you. I'm on their side. I take delight in them. And isn't it amazing that these things are connected? That those who love God also love God's people. Now, of course, that shouldn't be a surprise to us. We've seen this over and over in many places in the New Testament. As we saw this week, as we are walking through the letter to the Thessalonians in our daily devotions, seeing that Paul and Silas and Timothy shared their lives with the Thessalonians because they loved them so dearly. It shouldn't be amazing to us that a love of God, a love of Jesus Christ creates a love for those who also love him. Because it's God himself who who binds us together as a community. Binds us together as citizens of a common kingdom under a common king. We all have the same allegiance. An allegiance to the same Savior. And so we take delight in one another. This is the beauty of the communion of the saints. That we are knit together. That we, we share with one another. That we share people's joys. We share people's sorrows. That we love each other. And so David says, I am on the side of those who are faithful to the Lord my God. On the other hand, he says, the sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. He says, there are other people who have abandoned their creator There are those who have have traded the real thing for a fake, who have poured out blood on altars. And this is a a reference to the the bloody rituals that would have taken place in in Canaanite worship and in in the worship of all these pagan gods. And, And perhaps it's even a reference to child sacrifice that took place in Canaan as well that Israel participated in. This is how far Israel had gone. And David says, I saw, I have seen their worship and I have refused to participate in it. I have heard others cry out to the names of these foreign gods and yet I will not take their names on my lips. Instead, David says, my refuge is in God. And why? Because it is his paths that are good. His paths are good bring blessing, but the paths of these wicked pagan gods bring sorrow, not blessing. They don't give the delights that God promises. They don't give the delights that they promise. They are not the refuge that they claim to be. And so David pledges his service to the God who is the one true refuge and who gives good to his people. Well, this brings us to our second point, my inheritance because he says here in verse 5 the Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup you support my lot the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places indeed my heritage is beautiful to me now as David uses these words as he speaks these verses and writes them down. He's using loaded terms here. When he uses the word uh, portion, inheritance, lot, lines, and heritage, these words are loaded and they would have been understood by, by all of the Israelites who heard them. That when Israel entered the land of promise, they were all given an inheritance. They were all given a heritage, all except the Levites. They were all allotted 
a plot of land and the boundary lines were set out for them. Now perhaps this sort of thing doesn't translate so well in our day, although it probably does translate a little bit because in in our day, it's a little bit different because uh, you don't need to own land in order to have a, a, a high standard of living, do you? It's possible in our day to, to not own property and, and be, be well off, have a, an enjoyable life, have, have security. But the same was not true in Israel. Because in Israel, if you own land, that was a source of your security, it was a source of productivity. On your land, you could grow food to support your family. And it could give you an income besides. And so it it was so important to God that his people have land and that all of the families have land, an inheritance in the land that, that every 50 years God required that all of the land be returned to its original owners. To prevent any one family being saddled with, with generational insecurity, generational poverty, to prevent this, this generational inequality from spreading in Israel. God said, I want every family to have a heritage, an inheritance in the land. And so David says, I rejoice in my inheritance. I rejoice in my portion. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. But what's surprising about what David says is that he's not speaking about a a geographical space in Israel or anywhere on this earth. No, he says my portion is not a, a plot of land, but the Lord is my portion. My inheritance is the Lord himself. The Lord is my inheritance. Could we say that? It would be hard for us to say that so boldly. To say that that we look for no other inheritance, no other possession, no other thing in this life other than God himself. Because when we start talking that way, we start to get to the heart of our idolatry. And we ask ourselves, could I really let everything go except him? Can I really trust him for my daily needs? Can I really see that most of what I have does not fall under the category of daily needs, but is in fact extra? And yet I place so much value in those things. And what we see when we start thinking this way about all the possessions that we have, is that what we're really doing is placing our trust, taking our refuge in them rather than in the Lord. See, that's why we have so much trouble singing a song like this with a full heart. Because our hearts are so muddied with idols. Not with the idols of of Baal or Asherah or or Chemosh, no, but with the names of different idols that we take on our lips. Our house, our job, our television, our business, our friends, our car, our computer, our entertainment, all of these things that we we would hesitate to say, I could go without. I would give it up if only I could have the Lord. These are all beautiful inheritances in this world that we want. that compete with God to be our place of refuge. And this is what's amazing about the words of David, is that he says, of all of the allotments that I could have on this earth, he says, if I have the Lord, my inheritance is beachfront property in Rarotonga. He says, to have the Lord as my heritage means there is nothing in this world that I would trade for that. It is the best thing I could possibly have such that I would never 
give it up. Nor would I want the things that the world has to offer. And because of the beauty of that inheritance that we have, he says in verse 7, I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord, he says, who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. He says, the Lord has become my counselor. And he's, he's speaking to the fact that the Lord is the one who has directed his life. The Lord has given him his word, his commandments, his law. As, as guidance for his life, he has taught him the way to live, the way to follow him in obedience as his covenant God. But it's a word that also speaks to him in the night. The Lord counsels him and his mind recollects the counsel of the Lord in the night. That, that because he has meditated on the things of the Lord, when he lies on his bed and everything is dark and quiet, he remembers. He remembers the counsel of the Lord. And perhaps this is something that you have needed this week as you've laid on your bed, as you've wondered about the uncertainty of things going on in the world, as you've, you've spent the day watching the news or listening to the news, hearing reports of what's going on around the world, or thought about friends and relatives around the world and how they're doing. And as anxiety began to worm its way into your mind, It was then that you needed to remind yourself of the promises of God. And what that means is that we as the people of God need to be like David and be continually being counseled by his word day after day. To receive from the Lord the, the relief, the comfort, the assurance that he provides. And we need to be active in placing his counsel before our eyes. As we read in verse 8, I have set the Lord continually before me. This is why David is counseled in the night by his mind. Because when... He receives that comfort from the Lord and that assurance from his word. Then David says, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Do you see how idolatry and being shaken go hand in hand? Do you see how those two things are linked that we become shaken, we become anxious, we become discomforted when we place our trust in idols because, our, because the idols cannot be a refuge. The idols cannot satisfy. The idols do not live forever. These idols that we rest on are destructible and weak. But David says, if I fill my mind with the counsel of the Lord, if I set my mind on him, if he is my inheritance, I will never, ever be shaken. That is the key to having a one true refuge. And so, this is where David gets his hope. And so he says in verse 9, this is our third point now, therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. The psalm ends in trust, a trust that goes from his mind to his heart to his flesh. All of him re resounds with confidence in the Lord, confidence that his request will be granted, confidence that the Lord will preserve his life as he has asked for at the beginning of the psalm. But even more than that, David resounds with confidence asking in verse 10, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Now, here David is expressing a hope. And if you read a, a number of scholars, especially secular scholars who look at the Psalms, they'll say, well, here David is just simply saying, well, that he expects that he's not going to die, that he is going to be preserved. It, it's nothing more than that because they'll say the Old Testament had, had no real conception of an afterlife. There was no heaven in the Old Testament. 
And yet, as we read these verses, we cannot but be confronted with the fact that David's hope goes into and beyond the grave. Do we not see the language of eternity in these verses? Where he says that his his flesh will not be allowed to undergo decay. Where he looks forward as he says in verse 11, You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. Your right hand there are pleasures forever. He looks forward to dwelling in the presence of God. He looks forward to eternal pleasures. Now it's possible, it's very possible that that even David didn't understand the fullness of what he was saying. As we read in the the letter of 1 Peter, Peter says, As to salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. What Peter's saying there is that the Old Testament prophets, of whom David was one, they spoke under the inspiration of the Spirit, and and many times as they were speaking, they were speaking of things that that they could not even understand, and so they had to to read over and think about their own prophecies and, and investigate them to see what they meant. Yes, David is surely expressing confidence in this life and he's expressing confidence that goes beyond the grave, but he's also speaking about someone other than himself, whether he knows it or not. And that's what we read in Acts 13. As Paul says that that David, while he expressed confidence that he would not see decay. Nevertheless, being a human being, he did eventually die. He did rest in the grave, although he was preserved for a time. But what David needed was for God to provide a holy one who would be free from decay. And Paul says that is what God did. He provided Jesus Christ, the Holy One, the Holy One who went to the cross, the Holy One who was not left in the grave, but who was raised up again. After taking the punishment for our sins, He was raised to be in glory so that He would never be doomed to decay. And it's on the basis of that hope that David himself can claim freedom from decay, can claim being in the presence of God, can claim joy forever. You see, it's the benefits of the work of Jesus Christ that drive the force and the hope of this psalm. It's the work of Jesus that means we are not left in decay. It's the work of Jesus that means that as we look at our lives, we truly can say about ourselves, the lines have fallen for us in pleasant places. It's because of the work of Jesus that we can say to our God, we will not take the name of another on our lips. And it's because of Jesus that we can say to our God, I take refuge in you and you alone. It's because of the work of Jesus Christ for us, that Holy One who was not left to decay, that we have hope both in life or in death. Beyond anything that this world has to offer, an overflowing cup of blessings that makes the heart glad. So that even in the middle of distress, even in the middle of your anxiety, even in the middle of what you are struggling with today, you can call out to the Lord and say with David in Psalm 16 verse 2 you are my Lord I have no good besides you amen let's pray O Lord we your people thank you for the assurance and hope that you give to us that you are our refuge and that because of you we have all these many blessings 
We have the hope of eternal life, a hope that, that frees us from the need to fear. And so, Lord, we pray that you would calm our hearts with the words of Psalm 16, that you are the God who gives us good things, the God who cares for us, the God who is our inheritance And as our inheritance is better than any of the idols that we can seek in this life, help us, Lord, to rest our lives on you so that we may truly be able to rejoice, to be glad in all circumstances. And Lord, help us as we desire to set you before our eyes. We pray that you would do this work in us by the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.